Thanks to each and every one of you for being here today. I appreciate it very much. In my role as the seminary's archivist, I am confronted almost every day with the decision about what to keep and what to throw away. Take as an example this bust. As a physical object, it's actually quite unremarkable. It looks like it's made of bronze, but actually it's made of styrofoam with a thin veneer of plaster over the top, and it's painted to look like it's bronze, but it's not. If we had the time and the interest, we might describe its other physical characteristics, that is, collect metadata about it. Now, as near as I can tell, the bus was crafted in order to honor a leading figure in what would become the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. His name was Dr. Virgil Sly. He was born in 1901, and he was raised in Nebraska. He later graduated from several disciples-related colleges. And in 1928, he moved to Indianapolis, and he started a 40-year career as the stateside administrator of a vast network of disciples missionaries across the globe. He represented the disciples at several international ecumenical gatherings, and in the 1950s, he led the disciples in reformulating their theology of missions. He was married to a woman named Florence. The couple had three children. He died in 1978. Now, I can only guess, but I suspect that this bust commemorated Dr. Sly's retirement from the United Christian Missionary Society in 1968. It probably sat in a prominent place in the Missionary Museum of the denomination's headquarters, known to disciples as the Missions Building. The bust came to the seminary in 1996. It has been here ever since. And to my knowledge, this is the first time that it has seen the light of day in almost 30 years. <laughs> Every time I go into the back room of the archives, I see this styrofoam bust of Dr. Sly. He's keeping a watchful eye over the collection of disciples' books and papers, photographs and artifacts. And though I ask myself the question every time, I simply cannot bring myself to throw this bust away. <laughs> and I wonder why. Surely it's unusual for a Protestant seminary affiliated with an unsentimental denomination like the Christian Church Disciples of Christ to keep relics like this. And beyond that, I suspect Dr. Sly would hate the idea, not only of keeping the bust in the first place, but also now considering him to be archival. <laughs> <laughs> so why keep it? For that matter, why do we hold on to objects or papers or photographs of any kind that are old and no longer useful to us in other words, why do we remember? Why do we bother remembering? This afternoon, I want to explore with you an idea that I have been pondering for a very long time. The idea arises naturally, I think, out of 20 years of ministry as a historian of the church, as a pastor, and as an archivist. It is the notion that for people of faith, at least, remembering should be a spiritual discipline an intentional practice that brings us into closer relationship with God, with one another, and it should be a practice that helps us discern what God is calling us to do in our own time and place. After all, remembering is deeply woven into the faith that most of us here today have inherited. As Jacques Legroff reminds us, both Judaism and Christianity are religions of remembrance. For millennia, Jews and Christians have come to know God, not primarily through a set of abstract principles or even moral precepts, but they have come to know God through history, a shared history, and continual remembering of that history. The people of Israel, as Abraham Heschel reminds us, encountered God as a God of events, especially the deliverance from Egyptian slavery and the giving of the Torah. Torah. 
And later Jews reenacted these historical events through annual Seder meals, through the Feast of the Tabernacles, through Purim, all to remember their relationship with God and with one another and to discern what God was calling them to do in their present. And unlike other ancient Near Eastern cultures, the people of Israel articulated their basic moral precepts, the Ten Commandments, amid an act of remembering. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, so begins the Decalogue. The primary reason, then, that the people of Israel were to avoid idolatry, to keep the Sabbath day, to honor their parents, to refrain from murder and adultery and theft, all of it was because God had redeemed them in and through their history. Christianity, too, is a religion of remembering. One of my favorite services to lead at the church where I'm the pastor is the annual service of nine lessons and carols each Christmas Eve. I love it. I love it. The community of faith gathers and tells together the story of the birth of Jesus in scripture reading and in song. For a brief moment, we quiet the critical questions that we have about our faith. Were the Magi really at the Bethlehem manger? And we let the sheer act of remembering wash over us, connecting us to God and to one another, and hearing again what God calls us to do in the light of the Incarnation. If you belong to a Christian tradition that follows a liturgical calendar, then you understand the spiritual rhythm of remembering. Beginning with Advent, continuing through Christmas tide and Epiphany and the long season of Lent, and finally culminating in Easter tide and Pentecost. The liturgical calendar is a way of making time to re encounter the God of events, both as they are described and recorded in our sacred texts and if we listen in our own lived experience. It is a way of keeping in our memories things that happened. And so in this sense, at least, remembering is an act with deep spiritual significance. It is a discipline of the faith. Back when I regularly taught introductory courses in church history here at the seminary, I usually began the first lesson by asking students why they thought studying church history was important for their formation as leaders. Now, many students would start by reciting some variation of George Santayana's famous maxim, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. You've heard that too. Remembering was for these students a useful tool for avoiding past mistakes. Or sometimes I got the sense that other students wanted simply to build an arsenal of the church's mistakes to, just, to justify their relentless critique of it in the present. Others said that studying church history was important to them because of the many inspiring heroines and heroes of the faith whose example strengthened them when they inevitably struggle with their own lives of faith. In biblical terms, such people form a great cloud of witnesses that spur us on. Now, these reasons for studying history are not inherently wrong. I think they are merely inadequate because of their selective character. Picking and choosing what we want to remember because it serves our present purposes is not remembering well. It is not taking history seriously. You don't have to spend much time on social media these days to see all the posts about famous firsts either. The first to invent this, the first to do that. Sometimes even arguments break out that run something like this. They, whoever they are, taught you that this person was the first when in fact it was this person. And on and on we go. Selective remembering sometimes supports conspiracy theories. Concerning these famous firsts, Margaret Bendroth complains, we can stack up our heroes and heroines of the faith like a collection of baseball trading cards, but this does not mean that we are taking the past seriously. It does not mean we are taking our faith seriously. And I agree with her completely. Sadly, these days, many professional historians engage in this kind of selective remembering too. 
Two major schools of thought dominate the discipline of American history these days. The first is a collection of approaches that many will call the critical school. Emerging in the 1960s and flourishing in many quarters still today, this way of telling history represents a knee-jerk reaction against previous approaches, an important and needed corrective it's influenced by Marxist theory, and these approaches insist that American history is a series of long stories of class conflict over money and power and resources. In these narratives, people are divided neatly and inexorably into winners and losers, perpetrators and victims, oppressors and oppressed. The second, newer approach is what I call the neoconservative school, it emerged in the 1980s, not surprisingly, as an aggressive response to the critical school. Neoconservative historians weave a national narrative of commitment to certain big ideas, freedom and equality and free market capitalism. The school downplays or sometimes even denies conflict to stress what they believe to be common to all Americans, even if it isn't. In the end, though, the goal of this kind of history appears to be maintaining a hierarchical status quo. These two approaches to remembering American history, neither of which is wholly adequate, are in a pitch battle in our already divided society. If you need evidence of that, just attend the next meeting of your local school board. But here's what I want you to notice now. All of these reasons for studying history to avoid past mistakes, to find inspiration from heroes and heroines, or to advance a political agenda that you arrive at on other grounds, all of them suffer from the same failing, selective remembering. The resulting historical narratives are often two-dimensional caricatures. They rely on overly simplified cause and effect relationships. They ignore texture and nuance that are always a part of historical development. They refuse to acknowledge evidence that challenge their historiography, and ultimately, they misremember. The kind of remembering that I'm talking about here is a disciplined act. It takes expansive perspective. It attends to subtle nuance. It even courageously allows the past to change us rather than the other way around. 20 years ago, Peter Fitchie wrote a fascinating book about how Europeans and Americans saw themselves as actors in history as the 18th century gave way to the 19th. In the aftermath of political revolutions across the globe, these people believed that the past was irretrievable, that the future was entirely uncertain, and so he described the sensibilities of these people as being, listen, stranded in the present. I like that phrase a lot, because at least for me, it captures the way that I think many Americans behave today, even in the rare instances where we try to take history seriously. On the one hand, there are signs all around us that we remain fascinated by history, by the past. Since 1995, the History Channel, now simply called History, has been the first television channel dedicated to offering audiences exclusively historical and social scientific programming. In 20 years of the channel's history, it boasted 100 million subscribers. It was in 100 million American households. That's nearly one third of the population. Or how about the meteoric rise of Ancestry.com it was launched in 1983, and it was originally called Ancestry. It began as a platform for publishing family history magazines and genealogical reference works. But today, Ancestry.com curates 30 billion online resources, boasts a subscriber list that tops 5 million people worldwide, and runs a dozen other genealogical websites. Have you done the DNA testing? Beyond these recent history giants, David Lowenthal estimates that 95% of all museums and similar cultural institutions in the United States 
were built in the second half of the 20th century. He claims that Americans have been on what he calls a heritage crusade for more than 70 years. And he hypothesizes that it is based almost entirely on anxiety about losing our knowledge of the past as we face a difficult and uncertain future. Now, on the other hand, despite the apparent enthusiasm for the past, our capacity for remembering does not seem to be improving all that much. Most of the information that we produce and consume each day can be reduced to a 280-character tweet, the top five hits on a Google search, or text messages and, God help us, email. Information comes at us with increasing volume and variety and velocity, but none of us can keep up. And so all of us are vulnerable to the many ways that information, and by extension, our act of remembering, can be leveraged for political and economic and even personal purposes. Too often we make neither the time nor the effort to safeguard ourselves against the information onslaught. Now, let me be clear, I'm not a curmudgeon condemning modern communications technology. I'm only saying that most forms do not support the kind of remembering that I'm talking about here. A patient and intentional practice that brings us into closer relationship with God and one another and helps us discern what God is calling us to do in our time and place. Think, for example, about how being stranded in the present affects our own perceptions of the current conflict in Israel-Palestine our national political life, movements for justice for historically marginalized people. When we fail as people of faith to remember well, we forget God, we deny our interconnectedness, and we fail to chart a faithful future together. Now surely part of the problem is the fact that we are all thoroughly modern people. Now, perhaps surprisingly, the word modern dates to the 5th century of the Common Era, when the people of Western Europe struggled to make sense of the collapse of the Roman Empire. The Latin word moderna initially referred to the destruction of something old and the start of something new, an end that brings forth a new beginning. Now, though the term modern has taken on different shades of meaning in the last 1,500 years, it always has retained this basic sense of losing something in the past and an anxiety about the future. And so if you combine the sense of loss and anxiety with the way in which people understand time these days, then our dilemma of, moder of being modern becomes only more challenging. Lynn Hunt rightly claims that ever since the invention of accurate clocks, in the middle of the 17th century, Western people have understood time differently than they ever had before. Time became uniform. It proceeded at a rate that never varied. Time became commodified because the value of a product or a service came to be defined by how much time it took. And time moves forward and becomes increasingly distant from an irrelevant past. That's the way we see time. In a medieval painting, people are dressed in, Flemish, in the garb of Flemish peasants and adore the newborn baby in the manger. But to us, it seems like a curious anachronism, doesn't it? Partly because of the way modern people understand time, when we visit the past, we usually do so only as tourists. <laughs> we treat people of the past as odd of different values, unlike ourselves, who have ideas and ways of life that we could never accept. We might even unfairly judge them by our own standards of what is good and right and true. We're probably curiously interested in the people of the past and their time, but we always prefer our own, don't we? The past is a nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. What I'm contending here is time does not have to work that way, 
and remembering does not have to seem so foreign. Years ago, while I was working on a project with a dozen other historians, I learned as much as I could about the development of the Disciples of Christ in the Congo for the previous 120 years. Telling that story, often a very painful one to tell, was part of my writing assignment. I considered books and journals, unpublished texts, images, artifacts, oral history, everything I could get my hands on. And by the time I sat down to write my assignment, I really felt like I knew the history from the many perspectives of missionaries and the Congolese people, both past and present. But when I finally visited the Congo, years later, that history became real to me. In fact, I believe I can call it remembering. I stood in the old print shop of the mission headquarters in Bolingi and stared at the worn out printing press that had produced so many of the texts that I had read. <laughs> I had no trouble remembering how a man named Martin Joji got his start as a printer's apprentice. He attended college in the United States, returned to the Congo to become a leader for the disciples, both missionary and Congolese alike, between the 1920s and the 1950s. Now, I'm going to resist calling that a mystical experience, but for a brief moment, at least, I was no longer modern. Do you know what I mean? The past was not only relevant, it was retrievable. Time seemed to function differently. It became a strategy for reaching back instead of inexorably moving me towards some anxious and uncertain future. Have you ever had an experience of remembering like that? Moments like this, I think, teach us, as James Smith suggests, to inhabit our present with a certain lightness of being. In other words, they teach us to look in those moments for God's presence, for our connections to one another, and for clues about what to do in response. What I'm saying here is we modern people are not, in fact, stranded in the present unless we choose to be. Now, as dramatic as it may be to face them, the seemingly endless acts of violence in the name of religion, the corruption of the church, its complicity and injustice, and the countless moral failings of people of faith are not the most difficult thing that we must face in the spiritual discipline of remembering. I think the most difficult thing we have to face is our assumption that we are better and more enlightened than the people who went before us. Long ago, British historian Herbert Butterfield described this perspective as a Whig interpretation of history. Our memory of our past and our way of recounting it runs the risk always of becoming a self-congratulatory story of inevitable progress from a backward and ignorant and oppressive past to a sophisticated, enlightened, and altogether free present. Arrogantly, we see ourselves as the teleological end, the culmination of history. I think the Enlightenment is partly to blame here, especially the German-speaking variant commonly called the Aufklärung. Late 18th and early 19th century thinkers pioneered what eventually would be called historicism. The past became for them a distinct place back there, inhabited by people who are inferior to us and operating according to a set of rules that are less enlightened than our own. Occasionally, I get to teach a course here at the seminary called The Good Book, The Formation, Transmission, and Use of the Bible in History. Among other things, students consider how the perils of historicism were felt most keenly in biblical studies, in the development of the historical critical method in particular. Beginning in the 16th century reformations and continuing through the late 19th century, Western Christians read the Bible as an historic document. Now, I don't mean that they read it literally because most of them didn't. Rather, they read the Bible in a way that highlighted the continuity between the lives of biblical people and their own lives. 
Peter Thusen maintains that they did so. They did not see their lived experience and experiences of biblical people as separate things, as separable. Rather, they believed history to be continuous, part of the same truth, overlapping spiritually, even if not chronologically. Historical criticism of the Bible changed all of that. A distinct class of experts in the Bible began to emerge, and they delved deeply into the stories of the people of Israel and into the gospel accounts of Jesus. They assumed that the past was a distant place, far away, and irrelevant for, in many ways, the modern world. They began doubting the miraculous, including the resurrection. Armed with innovative theories of history, they questioned the objectivity of the Bible, and when archaeology failed to surface independent corroboration, many rejected the claims of the Bible altogether. To the advocates of historicism, it appeared that the Bible was not true, at least not in the sense that its claims could be verified by the available evidence. This is the essence of what is called the hermeneutics of suspicion. But the problem of historicism does not end there. The issue was not just whether the Bible was true, but it was whether the Bible had any value in the modern world at all. Historicism laid the groundwork for even more radical claims, not only about the Bible, but also about the, also about the idea of God itself. Maybe God is just a projection of humanity's ideal attributes, and in the end, all theology is anthropology, as Ludwig Feuerbach said. Maybe Karl Marx was right when he claimed that God was nothing more than an authority figure invented by capital to wield power over labor. The opiate of the people, he called it. Maybe Sigmund and Freud was right when he claimed that God was a way to manage our neuroses, as id, ego, and superego battle it out in the human unconscious. Ultimately, it seems that the primary casualty of historicism is God. The ultimate casualty of historicism is God. Hard-nosed historicism leaves people of faith with three unappealing options to abandon the Bible altogether, to continue to search for evidence, though it will never be found, for the Bible's truthfulness, or to reject historicism altogether and embrace an overly inflated, naive understanding of the Bible's authority by claiming inerrancy. Frankly, to me, the pre-critical approach to the Bible is more compelling than any of these options. God acts in history. History is continuous in some way, connecting people of the past with those in the present, and remembering offers us an indispensable resource for discerning what we are to do now. History does not lead to us. Its continuing unfolding includes us. Surely by now I have tipped my hand. <laughs> I have a fairly robust understanding of God's providence when it comes to understanding history and our act of remembering. The broad reform tradition of which I am a part has insisted for a long time that to speak of God's providence is to speak of God's control over all that happens. Literally, the term providence means God's capacity to see ahead and to act accordingly. And it is in its most monstrous distortion, this understanding of providence implies that human beings are not free to choose anything at all. An absolutely sovereign God remains unaffected by the condition of creation and the choices of people. I can't buy that. While I am not ready to embrace neoprocess theology as an entire system, I must confess some attraction to its understanding of God's providence. It runs something like this. God covenants with humanity, whom God has created to be free. Throughout history, God operates with what Paul Tillich calls directing creativity. God guides all creation toward God's chosen ends, but God in no way compels anyone to follow. Instead, God remains in travail with us as history unfolds 
Because at times we cooperate with God in progressing toward God's chosen ends. Sometimes we ignore God's directing creativity. And too often, I'm afraid, we subvert God's plans altogether with the choices we make. From a neo-process perspective, God does not direct history in a continuous progress toward some divinely determined perfect future. Rather, history is the story of how our covenant relationship with God works out in real time. Progress toward God's chosen end depends, at least in part, on our faithfulness. God always remains faithful. God will always provide. It is we who help decide how things turn out. Remembering is a spiritual discipline that treats both God and humanity as actors in history. It recognizes and celebrates the times when we participate faithfully in God's directing creativity, and it mourns the times when we have ignored it or subverted it. Now, I do remain reformed enough <laughs> to insist that no matter the choices we make, God still remains sovereign over history. God's purposes will be worked out one way or the other, with or without our covenant faithfulness. Now, what this theology of history demands of us is that we recognize the people of the past, we recognize that they are no better and no worse than us. It should make us more humble, more cautious about ourselves, because people of the past were not the only ones caught up in a cycle of success and failure in their faithfulness to God's purposes. You and I, all of us, are caught up in that same cycle. Remembering as a spiritual discipline beckons us, as Margaret Bendroth argues, to balance sympathy with judgment, to balance hero worship with sharp-eyed criticism. It recognizes and respects differences across time, but also looks for points of connection, genuine and honest points of connection. Remembering as a spiritual discipline is not about sorting out the good people from the bad or the real believers from the frauds. We can never fully know that anyway. Instead, it's about coming to a greater awareness of ourselves, of seeing things more clearly, the ways in which we have been responsive or not to God's directing creativity. The church where, in the church where I serve as pastor, every week we confess our faith of our baptisms by reciting the Apostles' Creed. In that most ancient of creeds is an affirmation that we believe in the communion of saints. And in a way, I think that this is the most radical claim of the creed. Woven deeply in the DNA of American Christianity, is the notion that we are all free to believe and practice our faith in whatever way we see fit. The idea is enshrined in the First Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This guarantee was a startling departure from everything that the earliest Americans knew from their past. But more than this, it meant that American Christians were finally free from the limitations of history and tradition. To many, the new nation was an opportunity to make a fresh start, to leap over two millennia of church history and begin at the beginning. Primitivists, they were called, because they treated the story of the early church in the book of Acts as if it were a blueprint for the church in their own time. Though they are certainly not the only group to do so, the early disciples of Christ are a sterling example of this attempt to live ancient lives, as Theodore Dwight Bozeman puts it. And that is what makes confessing a belief in the communion of the saints so radical to me. It means that we do not, in fact, cut ourselves off from the past and deny its relevance. It means that we value the attempts of people who have gone before us to live faithfully, that we honor their efforts, flawed though they certainly were. It means that we are in conversation with them as we strive to maintain our relationships with God and with one another and to discern a faithful way forward in our present. In fact, I like to imagine the communion of the saints as a great theological conversation. <laughs> 
that transcends time and place. It's a conversation that matters because it concerns important things. Whether it is the simple confession, Jesus is Lord, the more complicated confessions that define discrete traditions, or the more contemporary attempts to find relevant ways of living the faith with integrity. The conversation is best when it is lively and diverse and dynamic. Already the diversity is built in because of the length of time that this great conversation has already been going on. New people may enter with different levels of understanding of what's been going on. They might stay for a while and then drop out. They might emerge as crucial contributors to this great conversation. We just don't know. From time to time, the great conversation within this communion of the saints shifts in mood. It might be serious one moment, even deadly for some. At other times, it might be playful. And still at other times, it might be plodding and dull. Sometimes it will generate side discussions that make great contributions, and other times those side discussions will simply fall into silent irrelevance. But the one thing we cannot do is to deny the importance of this lively, this great conversation for bringing us into closer relationship with God and with one another, for discerning how best to respond to God in, the, in our time and place. As Jaroslav Pelikan notes, we will never understand and live out our Christian faith by, quote, progressively sloughing off more and more of tradition as though insight would be purest and deepest when it has finally freed itself from a dead past. Remembering is a spiritual discipline. It can never mean that only the living own the conversation and that those who began the conversation no longer have anything to say. It means rather that their faithful witness and their tragic mistakes all contribute to helping us understand ourselves and our faith more fully. We all like to imagine ourselves to be unique, one of a kind and absolutely unprecedented. But here's the inconvenient truth. The beliefs that we affirm the practices we engage in, the doubts that sometimes plague us, the assurance that we all seek, all of it belonged to people of faith long before we came along to inherit them. And so if we shut them out of this great conversation, then we ultimately impoverish ourselves. Remembering as a spiritual discipline begins with the assumption that all of us are obligated to one another in a deeply holy sense. At the center of our remembering is God, whose directing creativity invites us to join God and one another in pursuing God's chosen ends. But this kind of remembering also includes others, those who have gone before and those who are sitting right next to us. We owe it to one another to remember well and to treat one another with charitable understanding as well as loving critique, and to remain in the great conversation that will be enjoyable one minute and strained the next. And we must realize that how we remember carries moral consequences, because how we remember inevitably shapes how we act. We must be as intentional about acting as we are about remembering the two rely on one another when they become a discipline of our faith. All of this brings us back to where we started, the styrofoam bust of Dr. Virgil Sly, an ancestor of our faith. They bring us back to the question about whether to keep or to discard it. This bust is not a totem or an amulet that offers protection from malevolent forces. It's not a relic that facilitates a mystical encounter with God. It has no capacity to heal that I know of. <laughs> but the styrofoam bust does have power. In some mysterious and compelling way, it points us to the unseen. It forms an emotional bridge to a person who, like us, once sought to be as faithful to God's directing creativity as we are trying to be, 
If we will but listen, it reminds us that the past is, in fact, retrievable and that we do not have to face an uncertain future alone. And that's why I can't throw this bust away. Thank you. I'm happy to entertain questions if you have them. I have a question. Uh, Scott, I really appreciate your uh, lecture. I want to I want to think about two other terms within the matrix of what you're saying here. And they would be the opposite, I think, of the kind of progressivism that you're talking about. One would be, um, and they're both versions of actually thinking that the past is better than mm -hmm. the present, right? The yeah. soft version might be nostalgia, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, we've all been a part of congregations that in that sense seem trapped in the past. So the 1950s were so much better, the pews used to be fuller. That's, And then there's a perhaps a more intense version that might be almost apocalyptic, right? The past is of necessity better and history is a full narrative of decline. And so, uh, so I wonder if within the what you're giving us here, how you would think about those two frames in which, which honor the past, but honor it in ways that might actually seem detrimental to the present? Yeah, it's a great question, Rob. Um, after many years of resisting this, uh, I finally consented recently to lead a Bible study on the book of Revelation at Brown County Presbyterian Fellowship. <laughs> I hesitated, of course, because of the very thing that you're talking about, the tendency to see history, uh, the present as altogether degenerate, and we're looking forward to the time when God will make everything right, left behind series and all of that, right? So that was why I resisted. But one of the things that I've noticed right away, and we're only in chapter two of this study, is that if we think about time differently, we read the book of Revelation differently. And what I mean by that is I'm not at all convinced that the writer of Revelation saw uh, this sort of march of history toward God's final consummation, but rather the deep symbolism of a book like, of an apocalyptic book like Revelation, these are timeless. Right? These are cyclical patterns that have characterized communities of faith from the very beginning. And so if you start to discern in our own time what this or that symbol meant, you've already from the gate misrepresented and misinterpreted. I mention that simply to say that because uh, the, the question that you're asking is how do you address this? And I think, at least from my experience in congregations, uh, you have to do that very patiently. You have to work at it in a pastoral, with a pastoral sensibility. Uh, to arm, if, if I can use that metaphor, to arm uh, ordinary people of faith with the tools that they need in order to read the Bible differently in this case, or to understand history differently. It's patient work. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big believer in um, making a difference in a specific time and place. Right? I, I can't claim that I'll ever be able to convince American culture of this truth, but I can convince the good folks at Brown County Presbyterian Fellowship if I try. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. You said the thing about perspective of history that reminded me of my very first graduate class, and I wanted to ask a question about that. So my very first graduate class in philosophy was about Homer and the Odyssey, mm -hmm. an entire semester about Homer. And my professor was very Socratic and didn't tell us what to think, but had us read the text, and serious text carefully, looking at the Greek and comparing. And at the end, on the last day, I asked a question. I said, so what? do you think we should draw from this? Mm -hmm. And he finally answered, and he said that human progress seems to be a myth. Hmm. That is, human nature seems to be fixed mm 
and that we always had the same challenges to try to deal with. And it made me furious. I was <laughs> furious that he could dare say such a thing. But for the next five years, I couldn't let it go. I just yeah. kept wrestling with the question, and I realized when I understood more about what he meant yeah. that this seems to be human nature. Yeah. And then I tried to reconcile that with my understanding of the biblical text yeah. with Genesis and how we, what we might draw from this. Can you say anything to the notion about human progress? So if human nature yeah. might be fixed, how might humans change so that God's plans come to fruition over time? Well... Uh, <laughs> Well, I could point you to any number of biblical texts to start us off, but this has been a conversation ever since, yeah, I, I, ever since the beginning. Um, what, what can I say about it? I mean, I, I, I would double back to the, the point that I was making about the neo-process understanding of providence, right? Um, because it recognizes something about human nature at, at, a, at a fundamental level, right? I mean... <laughs> I'm an, I'm an admirer of Calvin. I, this is not a surprise to anyone. Um, and, and so, you know, of, of course, this idea of absolute depravity, you know, that, you know, you're nothing but a worm. You can never do any good. While I find that true often in experience, <laughs> including my own, uh, I, I also believe that human beings can occasionally uh, choose choose the good. And so if we go back to that neo-process understanding of providence, that this is a covenantal relationship with God. God has a plan. God has a, a purposes that are in God's mind. The, the question becomes whether we are, we make choices consistent with those purposes, whether we ignore them, treat them with indifference, or whether we actively resist them. Um, those are choices that we make. I don't think it's inevitable that people choose the latter of the, of the three. I don't think that's inevitable. I think it's common, <laughs> but I don't think it's inevitable. So this goes back to the kind of progressive understanding uh, that Rob was talking about just a moment ago. There is some hope for humanity. <laughs> I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I agree with you. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. And, and by the way, if, you're still think, if you were still thinking about that five years later, that was a good teacher. We'll take one more question, and I know it's going to be about neo-process theology. No, I'm not going to bring up neo-process. I'm just, I just hope this is recorded somewhere. <laughs> I actually really enjoyed your talk, um, you. and I actually wanted to talk to you or ask you in, uh, about this notion of time. Mm. This does seem to be we're focused on uh, Christianity as a religion that that really sees the sacredness of time, yep. um, and. I see that it happening liturgically throughout the year. I'm an Episcopalian, um, and so we're we have different colors, different. I mean, the wine is even different. Um, <laughs> we have bad wine. We have really bad wine at, at Lent, and then we have port for for Easter. There you go. Uh, which is really interesting, actually, because it's very experiential. Yeah. But I also wonder about the sacredness of place, because ah. it does seem like sometimes yep. remembering for me is most intense in different places. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah. I wonder if you might reflect upon that. Yeah, that, that's, very, that's very helpful. I, I really resisted the uh, temptation in this talk of making this a story about my own travels abroad, <laughs> right? Uh, but for example, the tour that we were just on last year um, and where we were at Auschwitz-Birkenau, right? Uh, talk about the sacredness of a place um, all of the stuff that I've been teaching for 20 years, the, uh, the influence that Clark Williamson has had on me about a post-Shoah Christian theology, all of that stuff, it all made intellectual sense, right? And I knew there was this place called Auschwitz-Birkenau, Arbeit macht frei, all of that. I knew all of that. But man, to be there, to be there, and to have all of that come back as remembering, that's what I'm talking about. So yes, a, a, a place has a lot to do with it. Um, one, of the, one of the students in the Doctor of Ministry program now is uh, wrestling with this very question. 
um, because she's writing a dissertation where she's doing a qualitative study on, on churches who have chosen to give up their place. Buildingless churches. And one of the things that she's discovering is there's something about place that helps sustain, cultivate deeper relationships with God, with one another, and give a sense of grounding. And so she's really wrestling with this very thing. All of that is to say, yes, I think place, as well as time, matters in the act of remembering. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, David.